Hello everyone again. Um, let's talk a little bit about a great problem that, uh, that I found some time ago. It was in a different, uh, different textbook than the textbook that we're using now. It was from the Kutnell and Johnson physics textbook. Kutnell and Johnson, 10th edition, uh, chapter 5, page 139, problem 30. I think David Young and Shane Stadler are the authors associated with this Kutnell and Johnson physics book. Uh, Kutnell and Johnson physics, 10th edition, but I think David Young and Shane Stadler played a substantial role in this 10th edition. So originally probably there may have been different authors. But uh, in the fifth chapter, uh, page 139, problem 30, there's this, this problem I kind of call the suitcase problem. Uh, I have this in, uh, in Canvas for you guys. So you can see this uh, in, in two ways that can, it can be done. Uh, there's a part capital A and a part capital B. They're both pretty good. To me, the part capital A that I'm going to show you right now is a little more intuitive, but it uses the fictitious centrifugal force as though you feel like the suitcase is going to fly off the carousel as it's rotating. It's a little odd how it's set up. Now look, the carousel is set up this way. It wants to roll down that way. The carousel is going around, coming out at you guys and coming back into the board and going toward the other room and in the other room and then coming back out at us. So it's rotating about this axis right here and using the fictitious force known as the centrifugal force, we can pretend there's this tendency that this has to want to fly off. Well, relative to the carousel, that's, that's a real tendency. I mean, if a, if a car takes a very sharp turn and I'm in the car and, and, it's, it's in the, the car takes a sharp turn and I'm in the passenger side and the sharp turn is not toward me, but toward the driver and the driving out, I hope the door is really strong because I'm gonna get thrown against the door even though I'm wearing my seatbelt and the door is not allowing me to leave the car. Relative to the car, I feel like I'm being pushed out of the car. In reality, the car is holding me in a circular path. It is pulling me into a circular path. My tendency is to go straight for is to go straight on, is to go straight, and the car continuously is pulling me into a circle. So that's the real force that's going on. It's the, centrif it's, it's the centripetal. The centripetal force keeps pulling me into a circular path. Does not allow me to do the tendency of what the mass of my body wants to do, and that is go straight. It is continuously not allowing me, the car is continuously, the car is continuously not allowing me to go straight. It is continuously pulling me into a circular path. That's the centripetal force. The centrifugal, that's a real force, the centripetal force. The centripetal force is real. It's constantly pulling me into a circular path. The fictitious force, the centrifugal force, I feel relative to the car that I'm gonna, I'm gonna be thrown out of the car. That's not really fictitious. For real, relative to the car, I'm gonna get thrown out of the car. If I'm not wearing a seatbelt, and if that door is not strong holding me in there. The reality, however, is, again, I want to keep going straight on as far as the laws of physics are concerned. And the car, the car door, and the car constantly does not allow me to go straight on. It is constantly pulling me into a circular path as this car is making turns, as this car is, is doing some sort of circular path continuously this thing is pulling me inward because if I was not attached to the car I'd keep going straight forward and that's however like but relative to the car it really feels like I'd be going out of the car yeah you can't argue that it's for real that you would really get be out of the car what's holding you in the car it's not really a force it's not really a force throwing you out of the car you're just your path is in terms of physics naturally is to go straight on the car is accelerating you by changing your direction constantly and pulling you into a circular path. That is the centripetal force. So the centripetal force is, is really the, is the inward, inward seeking force. And that's for real, that's, that's a real force. 
a fictitious force, the centrifugal force, has a lot of, uh, how we could say it, has some utility in the practical sense as far as being able to do some, some mathematical problems. Makes the mathematics maybe a little more intuitive as to what's going on. Let me use that fake force, the, uh, the centrifugal force, and see what's, what I think is going on or, or, or what maybe we can imagine is going on. Well, whether it's the centripetal force, the real force, the centripetal force, or the fictitious force, the centrifugal force, the centripetal force, the real force, or the centrifugal force, the fictitious force, the mathematics is identical for both. F sub C equals mv squared over r. F equals ms n. R equals 11 meters. Uh, they, they, and they gave us some stuff here. I mean, like I said, the, the radius about which this thing is going, you know, all the way around, The radius involved is 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 uh, is 11 meters. There's a, uh, a coefficient of static friction. Um, so let's see here. Okay, this is not going to be a good drawing under any under, under any circumstances. But here's your rate. Your radius is right here, guys. There's your radius. Um, hopefully you can see that pretty good. Let me draw a little darker. Uh, there's your radius, and it's going around as we said, and and we'll see what we can do at that point. Okay. Let me try to erase, I, I just got a feeling there's going to be a lot of stuff that's going to show up on this. So I want to kind of, okay. Um, Okay, guys, so we've got some stuff here. Let's, you know, like I said, I can, I can draw some things, not draw some things, we'll see here. We know that the frictional force, the frictional force is mu s times n, the normal force. Force centripetal is mv squared over r, that's the real centripetal force. The fictitious centrifugal force is also mv squared over r. So I can kind of employ that and see see if it has any kind of utility for us. Tell you what I'm going to do. There is a mass, mg, straight down. It's, it's the mass of, it's the mass of the suitcase. There is, as we've seen in the past, guys, if this is theta and this is 90, this is 90 minus theta, and this is theta once again. Here's your theta once again, theta which is the 36, 36 degrees that we're talking about. And here we got this. This is mg cosine theta. This right here, the slide down tendency, there is a slide down tendency here associated with the weight. Uh, this is mg sine theta. Okay, so just watch out how we're doing that. Um, this thing is going around at a particular, it's, it's going around here at a particular speed. So if there's an insect on this thing, it's got this, it's got this feeling, I guess. This, it's a made up force, but relative to the suitcase, it feels pretty, it feels pretty real for a person standing on that suitcase or an insect standing on that suitcase, how that would play out. So that's FC. Uh, write it like this, write it like this. Now, wait a minute, that's theta. These are two parallel lines. These are two, these are two parallel lines. Here's a transversal cutting them. If that's theta, alternate interior angles are congruent. This whole thing is 90 degrees, so this is, this right here is 90, this right here is 90 minus theta, 
which means that this right here is also theta. And this is 90 minus theta. And this is a 90 degree angle right there. If this guy is FC right here, this guy right here, this tendency right here is FC, forgive me, um, I'll call them FCX. And that is, that's going to be FC cosine theta. So I'm going to take, that's this guy. FCX is FC cosine theta. This is FC. So that's FC. This is FCX. We'll call this guy FCY. And that's FC. FC sine theta. Okay. Well, what's going on here? There's, there's, a, there's a lot of stuff here. Let's figure out what's happening here. Well, I guess, you know, there, there, there's a lot happening and it, it better be, I guess you can boil this thing down to one thing. Or you can boil it down to a couple things, and it, it, they all should, should be okay, guys. This is mg sine theta, the slide-down tendency. There is going to be small f. Uh, don't know how visible this is for you guys too well, guys. There's going to be a small f right here. For the frictional force right there this frictional force and mg sine theta they look at the end of the day guys i want to know i mean they're and they're asking they're asking a number of things here um here's how they asked the question i guess you could say let me let me start with the question the drawing shows a baggage carousel at an airport your suitcase has not slid all the way down the slope and is going around at a constant speed on a circle, r equals 11 meters, uh, as the carousel turns. The coefficient of static friction between the suitcase and the carousel is 0 0.760, and the angle theta in the drawing is, is 36 degrees. How much time is required for your suitcase to go around once? We're going to assume, the, the way the question asks, the way the question is asked is not necessarily the best way to ask the question. But it's still a great question. That's just my opinion. Perhaps we could say this is going at the maximum speed possible where it would still not move. We want to take this thing to the limit. We want to make this carousel go as, it's, it's a physics experiment. It's a physics experiment. We want to make the carousel go as fast as it possibly can go and still not throw this suitcase all over the place. The suitcase is going to stay where it is. It ain't going to slide down. I'm going to do that. I mean, certainly if you go really, really slow, I mean, if there's no friction whatsoever, then there's no speed that's going to let this, there's no slow speed that's going to make it happen. If it's stationary, this thing will just slide right down and without any movement if there's no friction. But since there's friction here, what's the fastest this thing could go and still keep the suitcase where it is? They didn't ask the question that way, but that's what they meant. Here we go again. We're getting back to the idea of Occam's razor, right? Um, Got to kind of make some assumptions there. So how fast can it go that way? Well, the fastest it can go on that. I, I, to me, guys, I think the, the very best way to do this is just say the following. This guy right here, the, fric the frictional force right here, wants to keep the suitcase up. The slide down tendency, mg sine theta, wants to slide down. But the frictional force wants to keep this thing up. The frictional force is trying to do a heavy lift. What's the heavy lift the frictional force is trying to do? The frictional force, the frictional force is trying to hold this thing up 
while MG sine theta is trying to pull it down, and also FCX, this guy right here, he's also got a tendency to want to pull it down. So the frictional force has got to be as strong as the slide down tendency and as strong as the centrifugal force component that contributes to even more slide down. Remember, if you move this thing, there's a bunch of things that seem to happen. If you spin this thing around, if you take this thing, the carousel, and spin it around, if I'm standing on the carousel, if, if I get on the carousel with those frictional forces in place of the suitcase, or I'm standing on the suitcase, let's say I'm standing on the suitcase, and I get on this thing, I get, you know, and, and I stand on the suitcase. When that thing starts spinning around, I feel like I'm about to be thrown off. I, I feel like I'm about to be thrown off of the carousel. The same way I felt that I was going to be thrown out of the car when the car was making that turn on the drive toward the, making the turn toward the driver, toward the toward the driver's side. I'm in the passenger seat and I feel like I'm going to be I'm going to be flying out of there. If I'm, if I'm on the outside of that turn that's being made, whether I'm, whether I'm the driver or the passenger, if I'm on the outside of that turn being made, I feel like I'm going to get thrown out of the car. Well, here I'm going to feel like I'm going to, I'm going to get thrown out of the carousel. I'm going to feel a little bit lighter. I'm going to feel lighter, like I'm on a, kind of like what happens with an elevator. This thing's going to pick me up a little bit, so I don't have as much frictional force on there either, guys. My frictional force gets taken away in a sense, a little bit, because I don't have a weight, my weight component I'm a little bit weightless. A little, I, I, have, I feel like I weigh less because of the, of the way I'm being spun around. So I'm not going to have as much contact with the ground as I would like. That's going to mess up my frictional force. So let's figure this out. Well, what does this mean? Well, the frictional force, the frictional force, is mu sub s times n, which means mu sub s times the normal force will give me mg sine theta. That's a slide down component. mg sine theta is a slide down component. And mv squared over r, oh yeah, that's what f sub c is. It's mv squared over r cosine theta. That's another kind of. This kind of the spinning, the spinning around, the spinning around gives me a slide down component this way and another slide down component that way, and this guy's got to pick up both. The frictional force has to be strong enough. The frictional, the frictional force has to be strong enough to fight off this slide down component, and to fight out and to fight off this component that tends to want to slide it down too. Here it is. Here's the original. I broke it up into a component. Here's the original. I broke it up into a component going up and one going sideways. This sideways one and that sideways one, there's a slide down component and there's another slide down component. Together, they want to slide this thing down. This has got to fight it off and keep them dead stop. And keep them dead stop. So he's got to be strong enough, all of that, whatever it is, has to be strong enough to meet up and to match the sum of this slide down component and the sum of that slide down component. Those two slide down components added together are a lot. He better be every bit as much as a lot. He, he better be the same amount. F has to be as strong as the sum of these two slide down components. F's got to be as strong as these two guys. Okay. Well, okay, that's F, right? That's what F's got to be. What's F? The normal force is the contact force. The force 
pushing off, I guess. Well, wait a minute. We're used to, you guys have seen this before. If you haven't seen it before, you'll see it soon. We are used to mg cosine theta going straight down. There is a normal force equal and opposite to mg cosine theta. Yeah, I agree. That was before you started moving. Before you start moving, this guy wants to get lighter. This guy, this guy FCY equals FC sine theta makes you lighter. The contact for this guy, I guess you could, you could kind of argue it a number of ways here. This is mg cosine theta. This right here is mg, mg cosine theta going straight down. Yeah, if nobody's moving, mg, co, mg cosine theta going straight down is balanced by a normal force, which is equal to mg cosine theta. When this thing starts moving, there's not a good contact force there. He loses some of his contact force. He would have been simply mg cosine theta. I agree. The problem is the mg cosine theta gets lighter in a sense. There's mg cosine theta. Yeah, and this guy fires up that way. mg cosine theta minus fcy, which is fc sine theta. That's the amount of the, centri the, the, the fictitious centrifugal force, so to speak. It's not too fictitious if I'm in a car and I don't have a car door and I don't have a seat belt and somebody makes a sharp turn and I'm on the outside of that sharp turn. I'm going to want to keep going forward. The physics of, of the universe is going to want to keep me going forward. The car is leaving my forward motion and not taking me with it. Relative to the car, I'm being thrown out of the car. It's not really a force that's throwing me out of the car. It's just the fact that I want to keep going forward and nothing stops me. If there's a car door there, I can feel there's a force keeping me in the circle. That's a real force. That's the centripetal force. The centripetal force. Relative to the car though, mathematically you can play a, a bit of a game with this fictitious force called the centrifugal force and it works and we're doing that here and you'll see this thing's flying out that way or it feels like it's flying out that way relative to relative to the carousel and the components are up and sideways that way okay the up yeah, if I was standing on that carousel and the friction's holding me up, I feel okay and I feel I got a particular weight. How much weight do I got? Well, my weight is not mg. It is, my weight is mg, but the component sideways that I'm on there is mg cosine theta. But if you start spinning me around, I'm going to start relative to the carousel and that fictitious force again, but relative to the carousel, for real, if I'm standing on a scale, I'm not going to be mg cosine theta in weight. Relative to the carousel, my, that scale I'm standing on for real is not going to read mg cosine theta. It'll read mg cosine theta if we're standing still. If we're standing still, my scale is going to read the sideways scale, the sideways scale. Straight up and down, I'm mg. I'm mg cosine theta on the sideways scale. And if you start spinning me around, I weigh less than mg cosine theta. The scale is mg cosine theta sideways if I'm not moving. If I'm, if I'm moving, I lose this much apparent weight. Oh, really? Subtract it then. The difference between the two is the amount of contact force you have on here. That's your normal force. That's the amount of normal force you got. So that right there is equal to, and that's, that's F. That, that's, what, that would, that's what F is going to be. This guy right here Mu S N, this is the N. This is the new normal force. That's F. And that's equal to, that's F. That's e how, strong, how strong does F got to be? We just said F. F has to be pulling that way. F is pulling that way. 
And he's as strong as MG and FCX, which is FC cosine theta, which is MV squared over R cosine theta. F, FCX goes down, MG sine theta goes down, MG sine theta and FCX are both sliding down. This guy meets them. Equal. Nobody's moving. So it's MG sine theta Okay, that's a lot. I mean, there's a lot there. Let's, uh, let's, let's keep cleaning it up a little bit. Let's, let's just dissect it as much as we can, guys. When we're doing this, we'll see where we can go. What we have is, is mu sub s. mg cosine theta minus mv squared over r sine theta. Where did that come from? Oh, that's fc. fc is mv squared over r. Remember, this fc right here is mv squared over r. So fc FC is MV squared over R, so FCX is MV squared over R cosine theta. FCY is MV squared over R sine theta. That's the force of friction. Mu sub S times the normal force. All of that's the normal force. This is what it would have been. If you're standing still, if you're standing still, it's mg cosine theta, nobody else. If you're moving, it's mg cosine theta minus mv squared over r sine theta. Here's your normal force times mu sub s. That's the frictional force. This guy going straight up. And he's equal to the sum of these two. These two guys right here. Absolutely true. What did I just do? Now let's make sure we see what I just did. Here's FC again. This FC is this FC, this FC is MV squared over R. FC is MV squared over R and multiply cosine theta. There it is. Yeah, that's a lot. Um, how important is that? It's it's it. It's the whole problem, guys. It's the whole problem. Uh, on this whole matter. It's basically the whole problem. You, got, you get it to here. If you can accurately, if you can accurately manipulate the equation from here, you're fine. This is everything. Remember this because you'll see it again. You'll see it again if you try it another way, the more standard way to do it. The mathematics, the logic works. The logic works. So there it is. This is it. Now, what's the end game to this whole thing? The end game is find the velocity. Find the mag. See, they didn't really ask us the question the way that perhaps I would have liked the question asked, but that's, that's just me, and that doesn't mean I'm right. I'm just, that's, but they gave a great problem, and they do brilliant work. And again, through Occam's razor, the assumption being made is basically this. Find me the maximum velocity where this will take place. So, all right, so there's a lot here. Let me not erase too much of the a lot, but enough. So leave that there. What's the end game, guys? Well, they're asking you, 
I guess they're asking. They, see, I wish you would have asked. Here's a bit. Again, I don't want to beat a dead horse on this one, guys. How much time is required for your suitcase to go around once? I got a better idea. What is the minimum amount of time? Because I don't know. I could, I could make that carousel take three days to go around. And the, friction, the frictional force is strong enough that it'll stay there. I want to know what's the maximum, what's the, what, what is the maximum speed that you could attain and still keep the suitcase as is. If that's the case, maximum speed means minimum time for an entire period to take place. What is the minimum period of rotation with the suitcase still staying there? What is the minimum period of rotation with the suitcase still standing there? That would be what I would have liked to have been asked. In fact, that is what we were asked, but it was asked in a different way, I guess. So that's what they're asking. Find the maximum speed where you can get away with that suitcase standing there. With that suitcase staying there. Right here, ladies and gentlemen, you're gonna solve, you're gonna solve for V. You're gonna take this guy and solve for V. So it shouldn't be too, it's not difficult. I tell you, I've done this problem many times. There are a few times I've done this problem without there being a minor, mostly minor errors that kind of make the whole thing kind of go badly for us. So just be careful with it. I mean, it's easy for this thing to go south. The goal here is if they want, they didn't ask it that way. As again, I don't want to beat a dead horse here, guys. But they want the minimum amount of time that would be required for this suitcase to stay as is. Minimum amount of time. That means you better be going pretty fast. I want you to go as fast as possible and still keep the suitcase in place. From there, that fast as possible that you get, you're going to find out what the minimum amount of time is. You've got to find out the velocity. For this to happen, for these to, and you know what? For these to balance out, you are doing the maximum amount of speed. This is the maximum allowed speed. Why? Because you set them equal. You set them equal, and if you set them equal, it's barely. Friction can barely hold its own, but it does. And that would be a maximum speed. Because friction will hold its own if you're going real slow, assuming the frictional forces are appropriate. All right, but if it's not, but, it, but, it, but if it's going way too fast, and it's, so I want the maximum that it can go and still hold it there. That's what we actually solved, whether they asked us or not. So that's the way the question should be asked. Um, so we're here, and let's figure out where this is going to go. Okay, I mean, I guess I got to solve. I got to solve for v. Simple as that. That shouldn't be too bad, guys. The hard part is what you just took care of. What we just took care of is the hard part. Um, just be careful. Like I said, there's very few times I've done this this problem without some wrench getting thrown into the whole process. Be real, real careful. Um, tell you what, let's take. Mu S, let's just do this, take mu S and take it all the way across. Let's take mu S and distribute it all the way across on that one. That's that. Uh, that equals trying to write big guys. Uh, make sure this can get seen pretty good. True. It's true. Um, let's get the uh, let's get the V. That's here, over to here. Let's get that over there, and we'll take it from there. 
let me add a positive, let me add a positive mu s mv squared over r sine theta to each side. Let me just put whatever's on the right side. Whatever's on the right side, I'm going to put it over here to the left. It might just be easier to look at. But just be aware of what just happened. Let me add a positive mu sub s mv squared over r sine theta on each side. Try to exercise the curse of this problem, guys. It's a great problem. And then let me subtract mg sine theta on each side. Yeah, that's, that's all true. Um, a lot of ways to go. I want to do this. Um, tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to take. I want to do anything too crazy here, guys. Let me. Uh, let me take. Let me take. Uh, there's so many ways to go here. Let me. Let me take mv squared. Mv. This is not necessarily the the way I did it in my notes that I have on Canvas for you, but it's really close to it. it should be really close to it. Um, I'm going to take mv, mv squared over r. I'm going to take mv squared over r out of here. I'm going to factor it out of there. Uh, let us make sure that this is OK. Yeah, this is fine. That's fine. And the other one's minus sine theta. Yeah, everything's good. Uh, I, I tell you, this problem's got like some kind of curse on it, man. It's a great problem. And just about every time you do it, you, you, you get like, uh, you get something else wrong maybe sometimes. So just watch out. Uh, it's a fun problem in its own way, obviously. Um, take mg out of here. Uh, take mg out of there. What do you want to do? Uh, yeah, I, I can see a bunch of stuff about the uh, go the right way for us. It doesn't matter. Hey, this is what's interesting. This suitcase could be as massive as an aircraft carrier. If the carousel was strong enough to hold it, and all the frictional and all the the, the moments of inertia, uh, forgive me, all all the um, uh, coefficient of static friction, moment of inertia. That'd, that'd be an interesting. There's a moment of inertia here too, guys. We're not going there. Definitely not. But uh, the coefficient of static friction, mu sub s, if it were the same, this suitcase could be replaced by an aircraft carrier. If the carousel were strong enough to hold it and big enough to hold it, and if the rotation was taking place in that particular, it was somehow set up, you know, it's obviously a, a hypothetical, far, very far-fetched problem, right? But let's say something that massive, as massive as an aircraft, something as massive as an aircraft carrier in the Earth's gravitational field were set up in that manner. It was really dense, so it could, it could be there, and uh, the carousel were strong enough to hold it and the frictional coefficient, uh, the coefficient of static friction were, uh, you know, were the same and, 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 and everything else, the angle the same, the radius, all of it holds. It doesn't matter on math. This thing could be as massive as a tick. This could be as massive as a small insect, or it could be as massive as an aircraft carrier, if it could somehow be put there and all of the apparatus, all of the, uh, the carousel itself was strong enough to hold it and you could fit it on and everything else, all of it works. What am I saying? I'm saying what I just said. The mass doesn't matter. Divide by M on each side and you got this. What do you say? What do you say? You multiply 
What do you say you multiply by r on each side and divide by this quantity? And you got v squared all by itself. Multiply by r on each side. All right, I'll multiply by r on each side. I'll leave the gr on, on the outside of that. And divide by, so this is, just be careful. So we got here, you multiply, you multiply by r on each side, multiply by r on each side, and then divide by this sum, mu s sine theta plus cosine theta. Yeah, so far so good. What's going on here? going on here is you're going to get the square root of both sides. Mu s cosine theta I'll write this somewhere else, make sure it's visible for you guys. Yeah, it's for real. True. Let me uh, let me write that somewhere out. Maybe it's it's always easier in the middle of the board, guys. I'm trying to. They got some great people working, helping us out doing this. So, all respect to them. I mean, they're doing great to allow us to be able to do this. A lot of people. So that was it, you guys. At the end of the day, and there it is. GR times mu sub s cosine theta. Yeah, it's something else. I mean, it's not the first thing I'm going to ask you to do on an exam, guys, obviously. You know, you don't get asked to do something like that. I mean, you could, but it's not, come on, realistically. But it's important. Look at what's going on here. Look at what is going on here. And I mean, everything is in there. Is there a way to solve it? Yeah, let's, let's just... Uh, Figure it out. Let's figure it out. Let's 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 put stuff in there and figure out what we're. We don't worry about the mass. I just told you this this suitcase. If it were made out of very dense material and it were as massive as an aircraft carrier, but not very but 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 not very voluminous, but very you know so very dense, massive as an aircraft carrier, let's say. And the carousel were strong enough to hold it. If all these numbers stay as is, it doesn't matter what the mass is. Say no air resistance either. If it's a small bug that could, you know, some wind, gust of wind, if somebody opened the doors could do so. None of that. Let's not worry about the wind or anything like that. This thing could be as massive as, this thing could be as massive as a small ant or as massive as an aircraft carrier and anything in between. And the mass doesn't play a role. What plays a role? R, G, all that. If you plug in, I'm going to leave it for you guys to do so, to just confirm what I'm doing. Mu sub s is 0.76. Theta is 36 degrees. 
R is 11 meters. G is 9.8 or 9.81, depending on what you want to use. But that's not. We're not going to. We're not going to split hairs on this, guys. Right now, this the, the, know what you're doing. Can you do this? Can we get this answer and then go from there? I mean, can I attempt to leave this here as a final answer on here and see how some of this stuff works out? Um, see if I can work around this somehow when I'm doing the other one. Um, the heck's going on? This is 9.8, this is 11, this is 0.76, this is 36 degrees, get the cosine, this is 36 degrees, get the sine, subtract, so go 0.76, go 0.76 times the cosine of 36 degrees, minus the sine of 36 degrees, get an answer, multiply it by the product of 9.8 and 11. Got an answer, good. Then, divide that answer you got by the sum of the following. The product of 0.76 times the sine of 36 degrees plus the cosine. In other words, the product of 0.76 times the sine of 36 degrees plus the cosine of 36 degrees. Get an answer here, divide it into there, Get one big answer and square root it for me. They are telling us, this thing's not moving that fast. It makes sense that it wouldn't be. It's coming out to about 0.5. Okay, so you look at it. Let me get more chalk, guys, actually. How fat? What's the maximum speed for this guy to barely hold on? 1.524 meters per second. Sounds good to me. Yeah, I, got, I got news for you. You're going to go around an entire circumference at a speed V for a time T. I'm going to see how long it takes to go all the way around. Sounds good to me. The circumference is 2 pi r. T is 2 pi r over v. 2 pi times 11 divided by 1.5 to 4. Do the math. 2 times pi times 11 divided by 1.524. It's going to take a while. 45. How could you verify that? Go 2 pi r, 2 times pi times 11, get an answer and divide it by 45.34. You're gonna find the speed is 1.524. Okay, you know that. You can do all the, the, the gymnastics that you want. This I used <clears throat> kind of the, made, the, the, the fictitious force that meteorologists apparently like to use. When we're talking about weather, there's, there's various fictitious forces out there that are used. I think in meteorology they're used uh, quite a bit where you can kind of look at it and kind of, okay, well, let me, let's see what it sort of would feel like relative to the Earth. Not keeping in mind that the Earth is actually moving. Right? Relative to the car, I feel like what I just showed you. Relative to the car, that's what I feel. I feel like there's a force throwing me out. The reality is I just want to keep going forward and the car grabs a hold of me and pulls me in. And that's what I feel when I hit against the, hit against the side of the door. That's the centripetal force, the real force. It's really what's going on. Relative to the car, there is a reality that I'm going to be out of the car and it, it feels like there's a tendency to do so. The faster I'm going and the sharper the turn I take, the more tendency I'm going to feel to fly out of the car. And that's that fictitious force, the centrifugal, centrifugal force that they talk about. So we use the centrifugal force here for the suitcase problem. And it worked out pretty good. 
they basically, see exactly how I want to argue this one. Um, and I've had, you know, like I said, my students have said different things as they've seen this. I'm going to show you, I mean, you, you've got the benefit. I'd like to say there's a benefit to it. You can always take the, the, the film and, and go, go back and look at the, the, the numbers I put up there. And you can also look at what I wrote on Canvas and see that they're the same numbers. I'm going to leave that there. Uh, and all other phenomenon are the same, unchanged. And we're going to get to right there with like a more standard way of looking at this. So let me see. I'm going to kick. Again, we already wrote a whole bunch, guys. So I think you're going to see this stuff again, and it's going to look... Well, I mean, you're just, you're just going to see it again. It's going to come out to the same exact thing. So let me leave as much as I can up here, and let me erase as much as I can at the same time. So let's see what we can do. This was part A. I just showed you method A that got me an answer, a good answer. It got me the right answer. It's a nice mathematical ploy if it's anything. Now, looking at in a more standard manner, using the real centripetal P, P in there, the centripetal force, let's see how that works out. And I've, like I said, I've, over the years, when I've shown this to the students, there have been, I guess you could say, I, I, I mixed reactions, for, a, for lack of a better word. Some people like method A that I just showed. Other people like method B that I'm about to show see what we can say here. Let me at least give you the setup. We don't have to take it all the way down there. The reason why I don't have to do it all the way across down there, because we already did it and got this answer. I'm, you're going to see that the answer is going to go straight to that, and all the other data is going to fall in line with what I'm about to do. So let me, let me see how I'm going to do this. Let's do it again, guys. I mean, Kind of making this angle a little bigger than I want to make it, but hey, maybe that's uh, maybe that's okay anyway. I mean, uh, here we go again. Okay, let me just see if that's visible pretty good for you guys. It looks like it is. Uh, yeah, it looks okay. It's not great, but it's it's okay. Uh, let me just try to do different. <coughs> let me do this. All right, let's see. Well, here we go again, right? I mean, so this should be old hat. Everything's the same, guys. So don't, there's less explanation needed, I guess you could say. Uh, if this is theta, this is a transversal cutting two parallel lines. Transversal cutting two parallel lines. So what does that mean? That means that this right here, that's theta, and that, so there's a lot, lot going on here. So, forgive me, guys. How's the saying go? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And I tried to, so just straight out like that, and then these guys coming out this way, okay. Still not great, but anyway. This is theta, that's also theta. This is theta, this is also theta. There is, okay, now you got to be careful. There's a normal force going perpendicular to this guy. We'll call him N. There's a frictional force. These aren't really drawn to scale, guys. Yeah, we already talked about these. Mayless, you might say, hey, what are you talking about? You were doing all of this. Yeah, I know, but it's going to be a little bit different. Now we got this. There's this guy. 
going straight down. That's mg. Okay. Now you're probably wondering if this is if this is theta. Um, there we go here. If you now we gotta be careful. If this is if this is theta, and this is a transversal, and this line and that line are parallel. These two lines are parallel to each other. These two lines are parallel to each other. And the transversal cuts them. Corresponding angles are congruent. So if theta is 36 degrees, if this is theta, this is also theta, right here. That's also theta. Um, if this guy picks up, forgive me guys, like the eighth time I'm erasing the dotted line here, I just gotta, I wanna, make sure it lines up with with how I line these guys up okay so we got this so we got same kind of thing here though this is and we got this all right so that's all right this is theta all right, corresponding, now, this line and this line are parallel to each other. Here's the transversal cutting them. Here's theta. This guy picked, it was a 90 degree angle right here. It was a 90 degree angle, this, like, straight up and down here. I don't want to draw too many of the, of the data there because I think it's going to get even more confusing than hopefully I'm, I'm not making it right now, but I, it could get even more confusing. So, Basically, this right here, that's a 90 degree angle. If you pick this thing up, this is 90 minus, if this is theta, this is 90 minus theta. But wait a minute, this and this are perpendicular to each other. If this is theta and this is 90 minus theta, 90 minus theta plus theta gives you this 90 degree angle. So this guy's theta. Again, I'm sorry for this alphabet soup of, of lines I'm drawing, line segments here. Hopefully you're not, I'm hoping you're not even, you're seeing them okay, but they're not cluttering you too much here. Um, if this is theta and this whole thing is 90, if this is theta and the whole thing is 90, this is 90 minus theta, this and this make a 90 degree angle. If this is 90 minus theta, this is also theta. This is 90 minus theta right there. That's theta. This is 90 minus theta. This right here, that's a 90 degree angle. If this is 90 minus theta, ladies and gentlemen, here's another theta for you. You got theta here, you got theta there, you got theta right here, you got theta here, which you don't really need, but these thetas right here you do need. All right, sorry about that. I mean, I, I could have just wrote them there, but I actually wanted to derive why they're coming from where they're coming. The centripetal force truly goes inward toward the right, in this case, horizontally to the right, and is the resultant of, let's see here, it is, the resultant, it, it, it is the resultant of the horizontal vector sum of x components of fn and f. Okay, now we gotta talk. Um, we had different color chalk guys other than what I got, but I got this right now, so let's go with it. This is F. This is N. Uh, these are not really drawn to scale, so don't. I don't want you, you know, too crazy. You know, worrying about it too much. Um, there is a centripetal force, a real centripetal force, and basically, it's the horizontal component of the friction force, this way, plus the horizontal component of the normal force. The normal force is going sort of in an opposite direction kind of thing. When I actually get the horizontal component of the normal force, bring that straight down, it's gonna be going this way. When I take this guy and get, here's a vertical component, here's a horizontal component, get this guy's horizontal component, I'm gonna do a vector sum, it's gonna be a tug of war, and one beats the other. What's going on here? Okay, leave that up there. Let's leave that up there and let's see what's going on. We're gonna see, we're gonna get that, we're gonna get that again. 
We know that the centripetal, the real, no fictitious force, the centripetal force pulls inward. Friction is stronger than the normal force. Well, yeah, at least horizontal component-wise. It better be, or else this guy ain't, ain't holding on. That's for sure. The frictional force, the horizontal component of the... I, I, I don't know what to write now, guys. I, I don't, I don't want to mess you up more. The horizontal component of this guy is this. And the horizontal of this guy is that. So you take this guy and that guy. There's a tug of war. This one wins. This one wins. By how much? Well, let's figure it out. Let's figure it out here. N, that guy goes that way. This guy goes this way, right? It's that guy right here. Vector sum of this and this, this guy wins. This is F cosine theta, and this is N sine theta. And there's a tug of war between them. F cosine theta minus N sine theta. Is that true? Let's have a look. That's theta, which means, you know, this, this right here is theta. You know, this right here is theta. This opening right here is theta, which this is 90 minus theta. This is 90 minus, this is theta again right here. That guy right there. So n sine theta will give you this guy. F cosine theta will give you that guy. n sine theta, n cosine, I'm sorry. F, this is F cosine theta. This is n sine theta. This guy wins it. By how much? Well, F cosine theta minus N sine theta. F cosine theta minus N sine theta. That's FC. What's going on here? Uh, well, how smart are we on this stuff, you guys? How, how sharp are we? How smart am I on this stuff? If I'm claiming I know how to do it, it's easy to make a mistake here, guys, for any of us. Well, how smart are we on this stuff? I mean, if we do this in a very savvy manner, in a very smart manner, we can get out of this thing okay. Isn't the frictional force equal to mu sub s times the normal force? That's what the frictional force equals. That's what the frictional force equals. What do you say? Pull an N out of there, guys. I didn't, I didn't, I never told you what the normal force was. In a backhanded way, I just said it exists. In a backhanded way, in a backhanded way, I said it exists. I didn't tell you what it, I, I, I pointed to where it is. I didn't say how big it was. I just said that. That's FC. Yeah, okay. Keep that in the back of your mind. Got another question to ask you. Is there a vertical component for the normal force that goes straight up? Is there a vertical component for the friction force that goes straight up? Yeah. Is there a weight force that goes straight down? Yeah. Oh, by the way, that weight ain't moving. That weight ain't moving. So N cosine theta is this, and F sine theta is that. And that's going to equal to mg. So what does that mean? That means they all add I mean, Look, let's, let's make a long story short. N cosine theta. N, N is this guy, N cosine theta, I, I had no room to write the N, I'd rather write the N way up there, but N cosine theta is the upward component 
of the n, and f sine theta is the upward component of the f. n cosine theta, they're, on, they're teaming up together on this one. Here they're fighting each other. That guy's fighting that way, that guy's fighting that way, the other guy's fighting this way. I get that. They're fighting each other on this way. The end result is the total centripetal force that is ex being experienced. The total centripetal force is the result of the tug of war between the weak component subtracted from the strong component. Strong component subtract the strong component here, strong component here minus the weak component will give you how much resultant force is coming this way. That's the centripetal force we're going to say. We're going to say that's the centripetal force. This guy going up and this guy going up, they team up together. This is n cosine theta going up. This is f sine theta going up. They're both going up. They're both going up. If you subtract mg, the weight, it's zero. Nobody's moving. Is there another way to write that? Absolutely, and I wrote it different ways here. You can write it like this. What does, that, what does that mean? That means the downward pull of mg is balanced, ladies and gentlemen, by n cosine theta plus f sine theta. Really? Yeah, really. Okay. Um, do we got a way out of this one? The number of ways you can go, uh, but I, 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 we need to say that. Um, I'll try to think here exactly what I did. Right, 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 right. Okay, watch this. Is that true? Yeah, let's, let's talk about it. Mg equals n cosine theta plus f sine theta. Is there a way out of this? Uh, yeah, kind of. Is it true, n is n, nobody's debating that, f is mu sub s times n, whatever n is. I've, I've, I've been very backhanded in this part b, in this second way of showing you how to do it. Remember, with the first one, with part a, I gave a definitive answer or at least close to a definitive answer, as to what the normal force is, what the apparent normal force is. What am I feeling? What's the apparent weight I'm feeling? That apparent weight I'm feeling standing on that scale, the scale pushes back up at me with that same apparent weight. That's my normal force. I did that earlier when I showed you the first way to do it with the fictitious force, mv squared over r. And the real force is also mv squared over r when you do it. Again, it's a, it's a question, it's a, it's a bit of a mathematical ploy. This is more standard. I, but I did tell you what n was. I gave a numeric, not a numeric, I gave a symbolic, I gave a non-numeric symbolic explanation as to what the normal force was. And if I plugged in numbers, I'd actually have what it is. I could give you a numeric answer for what the normal force was. You don't really quite go there here. You do and you don't. You do and you don't. Uh, on that one. You, you, can, you, can get, you can get there. You're going to see it's going to be the same answer. Here's the crazy thing about it. Um, stuff's easier done than it is said, guys. True? Yeah, it looks true to me. Um, yeah, I, just, I, just, I, I wrote what I wrote. I pulled, I pulled the end out. Let me solve for n. Time out. Let me say that again. Let me solve for n. Now I'm going to solve for n. Let's solve for n. Let's divide that, this whole quantity 
on each side. That's N. Where should I put the N? I got an idea. Go right there. Here's N. That's MG. Yeah, okay. Let's... Cosine theta plus mu sub s sine theta is the same as, it doesn't matter the order you add them, right guys? How about mu sub s sine theta? I just want to make it look like the other one. Um, mu sub s sine theta Okay. Uh, yeah. All right. Looks pretty interesting. Let's see what else we can say. It is for real, FC. Fc is for real, and it equals mv squared over r. Here we go. It's a great way to do the problem. There's nothing wrong with this. In fact, it's, the, it's strictly speaking, it's the most correct way to do the problem. The other way, there's something, there's something to it though. You know, it works. It's more in an intuitive feel. It's a math. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful mathematical ploy in a sense. But no, this is kind of the strict way to go. Um, Okay, starting to look real familiar, if you ask me. Yeah, uh, again, ladies and gentlemen, divide by m on each side. Divide by m on each side and multiply by r. Divide by m on each side and multiply by r. Great. I'm not done. I'm not done, but you know I'm close to done. Look around. I left this thing up here in bold colors for a reason. Certainly ain't done yet, though. What do you say you take what do you say you take this right here? What do you say that you take this right here and square root both sides? Take this equation and square root both sides. Bam. No difference whatsoever. That is not a coincidence. I mean, if you solve it, well, it's, for numerous reasons, it's not a coincidence. If you do, if you solve a problem correctly, it doesn't matter how you solve the problem. You're going to get the, if there's only one answer for it, and there is in this case, only one answer, 
If you solve the problem correctly, then you will always get the right answer, regardless of how you solve it. I just showed you two ways to do it. This is strictly speaking, and square root both sides, here it is, v squared, v squared equals gr times the quantity mu s cosine theta minus sine theta over the quantity mu s sine theta plus cosine theta, without a doubt. It's the same exact answer. This is, um, yeah, I mean, I can say what's being experienced there with the normal force. There's a push up, so the push over that way, and there's a frequency pull that way. I, I like myself, I, I mean, for me, it's part, uh, the methodology that I did in A, to me, is more intuitive. This also is quite intuitive, though. But I, my preference is, um, you know, the methodology of part A, the methodology of method A, I, I like quite a bit. The methodology of method B, which is this, is also excellent up to you. Both work. The, the, the way this works is there's a friction, there's a pull. How much of a pull? Well, there's a component of pull that way, and there's a component of pushing this guy away, or at least reacting to what's going on here, and it's that much. The difference between the two is an imaginary rope. It's, an, it's, it's, like a, it's, it, it's as though uh, the difference between these two forces is like the strength of an imaginary rope holding this thing. And then from there you do the physics. And that's fine, that works fine too. This is excellent stuff you guys, it's, it's uh, great content. Um, makes you think, now, I don't need, uh, again, we square rooted both sides, the, square root, the square, square root of V squared, square root of V squared is V, square root of all this is the square root of all that, you get this. You plug in all the values, you're going to get the same numbers I got earlier. So there's something there. It's very neat stuff. Uh, ex excellent stuff. Okay, thank you for your time, guys. We'll talk again soon. Take care.